Hi, welcome to module 5.12. Uh, my name is Ivan and I'm a PhD student here in Alcabet APFL. So in this module we're going to go through an example from acoustics. Uh, acoustically, we describe rooms or enclosed spaces such, such as cathedrals by something called the room impulse response. So how do you get this room impulse response? Where you simply put a microphone in a room and a loudspeaker and somehow you measure the impulse response of the channel between this microphone and the loudspeaker. What you end up with is essentially a filter, a linear shift invariant filter. And the great thing is that we can recreate acoustics of any enclosed space simply by convolving a sound sample by this room impulse response. And another great thing is that this sounds amazingly realistic, as we're going to see in the lecture. But so, what about an inverse procedure? So, what if you recorded uh, some sound sample in a cathedral, for example, and now we want to get rid of the echoes. We want to have a dry sound, original sound, as, it as if it was sound in, for example, an anechoic chamber. So can we do that? And in this module, we're going to see how to do it in a simple setting using some tools that you already know about. So, for example, we're going to use some tools from, from filters and some very simple Z-transforms. Uh, after going through this example, we're going to take a look at the different problem, which is called acoustic echo cancellation. And this is something that you need to care, take care of when you're, for example, talking over a phone or over Skype. You can imagine that your voice gets transferred to the other side, where then it gets pick up, picked up by, by the microphone again. And this is this annoying echo that you hear when you're talking over Skype sometimes, for example, if it wasn't properly cancelled. Okay, so off we go. Module 5.12, the reverberation and echo cancellation. All right, so it's good to start by saying a couple of words about how sound propagates in rooms. So here we're going to have to deal with two effects mainly. Uh, and first one of them is something that we call free space propagation. And this is something that you observe in practice, right? The further you are from the source of sound, the lower the volume. It turns out that for a point source of sound, uh, this can be described by the following statement. Sound pressure is inversely proportional to the distance that the sound had to travel. This is equivalent to saying that it's inversely proportional to time with another constant that the sound had to travel. Uh, another effect is reflections. Okay, In, in rooms, sound reflects off the walls and every reflection attenuates the sound. In practice, these reflections are, these attenuations are uh, depending on the frequency and on some other things it's like different materials and different walls but we're gonna model them using a single coefficient alpha here so we're gonna say that uh, every reflection attenuates the sound by alpha and what we mean by that is that if the sound pressure of the sound wave just before hitting the wall is P then the sound pressure just after bouncing off the wall is gonna be alpha times P Okay, very simple. So in principle, this alpha is strictly smaller than one. So it turns out that we can describe the room as a linear filter. And what does this mean? Well, this means that if we want to describe the system between the source of sound and some sound sync, for example, a microphone, then we can simply write out what the microphone picks up. So the thing recorded by microphone as the emitted sound, the input sound, convolved with some impulse response, okay, corresponding to the room, describing the room. We call this impulse response the room impulse response. Okay, this is a very common abbreviation. Now, this is good news because it means that the room is just a linear shift invariant system once we fix the locations of the source and the receiver. And this means in turn that we can use all the tools that we developed so far to deal with linear shift invariant systems, for example, the discrete time Fourier transform or the Z transform, to deal with rooms. Fabulous. Okay, so let's start by, by hearing how some very different rooms sound like. And we start by an anechoic chamber. Uh, this is a room that is designed in a special way so that there are no reflections of the walls, there are no echoes. Has the name anechoic and uh, you know for example having a conversation in such a room is really weird because 
you really have to look at the speaker. Once you turn your head around, there are no reflections. So, uh, yeah, he also said that this room sounds very dry. Let us listen to a sound sample uh, recorded in this room. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. All right. So, without any context, you might say, okay, this was recorded somewhere, I don't know, in some room. But in fact, you might have noticed that it is extremely dry. All right, now we, we move on to the next room, which is not an aquatic anymore. So this is a small classroom that we emptied here at EPFL, and we were running some experiments in it. So we had the impulse response measurements. Now, just for fun, we can try listening to the impulse response itself, so to the signal age. It sounds like this. As if someone fired a small starter pistol or something. So you might notice that it's relatively short. We say that this room has a, has a relatively low reverberation time, short. And the same sound sample from earlier reproduced in this room sounds like this. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. So it is definitely more natural and you can hear that it's not as dry. There are some echoes in this room. It's, the sound is richer. Finally, we can take an extreme example of a cathedral. And, you know, you know from experience that, that these large buildings, they have very long reverberation times. And so let us listen to, to the impulse response of a cathedral. So it is very different from, from the impulse response of a, of a small classroom, right? It's much, much longer. These are very reflective surfaces and there's a huge volume, so the reverberation time is very long. And the same sound sample reproduced in the cathedral sounds like this. Die Natur hat den Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören und sprechen können. As mentioned earlier, these sound samples were obtained simply by convolving the original sample from an anechoic chamber with the impulse response of the corresponding room, so BC 329 or in the EPFL classroom or the cathedral. Now we can start having some fun. Let us analyze a very simple room that will allow us to write some formulas explicitly. This is not really a room. So imagine that you're standing halfway between two very long walls. Say that these walls are infinite or just very long. And these walls are at a distance d from one another. Okay, And the fact that you're standing exactly halfway between them means that the reflections, and you're having a microphone, okay, and the reflection from this wall okay, will arrive at the microphone uh, at exactly, or you know, approximately, but we're gonna think about exactly the same time as this reflection from this wall. This simplifies some things, okay? And the impulse response of this room, uh, where you're standing, is given by this formula. So notice that it is just a bunch of shifted delta functions. Each delta function models one reflection, and we know that the cage reflection must be scaled by alpha to the k because it was attenuated k times by a wall. And there is also this free space propagation. So notice that in the denominator, there is this k times t term, which models the free space propagation. And this epsilon here, uh, it just helps us. It's like a patch for a formula to avoid division by zero. Or if you want, it models the, the, the first direct path to the microphone because the microphone is a bit removed from the mouth. It's not exactly collocated. And what is capital T? Well, it is just the time necessary for the sound to go from, from, from the source, so from the mouth, to the wall and back. So what is it? it the, sound, uh, the distance that the sound has to travel is exactly 2 times d a half, so it's d. And the time it takes then is... is, is D over uh, C, the speed of sound. Okay, so capital T is equal to, to, to D over C, okay, the speed of sound. 
So what is capital N? Here it's it's the time measured in samples that it takes for one one uh, reflection to occur. Okay, and it has to be an integer because we're working in discrete time and we want everything to be on the grid. So we want it to be shifted by an integer number of samples. So we just round, okay. So we round the time in seconds multiplied by the sampling frequency, which will correspond to the number of samples. Uh, and finally, you know, you should not see this formula as being an, a very exact model for something, but it's a very good model. So it describes very well what happens in this situation, and it's going to serve us to derive some, some interesting things. In fact, this formula is still a bit too complicated. We don't really like this 1 over kt term. Uh, it will wreak havoc in, uh, in, in the Z transform. So what we want to do is we, we're just going to get rid of it. You know, it's difficult to handle in the Z domain. It will make us trouble. So why not simplify further? So we're going to assume that the dominant attenuation is due to reflections only and arrive at this approximate impulse response that we're going to use uh, in the beginning. Okay, we just features alpha. And this approximation is not very good. But we'll see that even if it's not very good, it gives some very good results. Okay. And nice thing is that this has a simple Z transform. Okay. So now we want to hear how these things sound like and how they look like. Okay. So this here is the simplified uh, impulse response. And this here, on the right hand side, is the realistic impulse response with a 1 over t term. And we can see that they are quite different. And they also sound quite differently. So here we can first listen uh, to the original sound. This is going to be our benchmark sound. One, two, three, four. Okay, it's some voice and some guitar. Then if we play this sound and convolve it uh, with the with the approximate room, it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Sounds bad. Says that the room is really large, uh, so we can actually hear the individual reflections, and it the walls are quite reflective. And in, in what we call a realistic room, uh, it will sound like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, so it is much more natural, even though obviously it's not a real room. Our goal now is to invert the room. So we have the reverberated sound and we want to get rid of the room influence. So we, we want to remove the echoes, the reverberation from this sound. And we're going to do it using signal processing, of course. So the reverberated sound is given as a convolution, okay, and here we we say that it's given as a convolution between the input sound X and the approximate impulse response. Okay, And our goal is to design a filter that reverberates this sound. So we're going to have a simple linear scheme, nothing complicated. So we want to design a new filter that we call the inverse filter, HI here, that when convolved with the output signal, with the reverberated sound, gives us back uh, the dry sound, the original input signal. Okay. So, let's play with this expression and then get a very simple solution to this problem. So, we want that the inverse filter convolved with Y gives us X, okay? But we have the expression for Y. It's just the, the input signal convolved with the room, okay? And we convolve this uh, with the inverse filter. And now we use the properties of the convolution, okay? And the particular one that we use here is associativity. So we put parentheses differently, we just parenthesize these guys, and so we see that what we actually ask for is that x is equal to x convolved with something. Okay. Okay, so first we simply write out uh, an expression, a definition of the Z transform. Then we plug in what we what we had computed. For, for the room impulse response, for the approximate room impulse response, okay? And here we just use the properties of the delta function, of the delta sequence. So 
we can switch the sums. So this here is actually equal to, to first sum over k, and then uh, we can put alpha to the k here, and then we can put sum over n, and uh, whatever depends on n inside. So this is just z to the minus n, delta of uh, n minus k, capital N. All right. And uh, now the delta sequence will sieve out the values of whatever is left here, multiply with it at k times capital N, right? So we can write this out as being equal to sum over k and then alpha to the k and then z to minus k capital N, okay? And this is exactly this expression here with k exchanged by n for whatever reason. Okay, what remains to be done is just to sum up this geometric series and we did it many times, so um, we know how to do it, okay. All right, and not happiness, because now we can invert the room. And as we said, Z-transform of uh, our inverse filter is just one over the Z-transform of the room impulse response, of uh, the Z-transform of the room impulse response, okay. And luckily, it turns out to be a very simple filter. It's, it's a finite impulse response filter that has only two taps different from zero, one at uh, position zero and another one at position capital N. And now even if this observation might seem very innocent that uh, finite impulse response filters cancel exponentials, exponential impulse responses, it's in fact in, in the basis of, of some modern sampling theories of something that is called finite rate of innovation sampling that you might want to look up if you're interested. Now here we show equalized room impulse responses. So this is just the convolution between the inverse filter and the approximate uh, room impulse response on the left-hand side and uh, the realistic room impulse response on the right-hand side. Okay, And as we were designing our inverse filter exactly for the approximate impulse response, it comes as no surprise that we get a delta function on the left-hand side. Uh, what may be surprising is that even on the right-hand side, we get something that's not too far. Even if the room impulse responses are very different, they appear to, to look very different. Uh, the bottom part shows uh, magnitude of the DTFT of, of these equalized room impulse responses. We would expect this to be constant, to be to be equal to 1. And we see that it, it is indeed, of course, the case for... for uh, the approximate impulse response, but even when we apply to the realistic impulse response, we get something that somehow stays close to one. And now let us hear how these things sound. So first let us hear uh, how it sounds if we come off the sound with the approximate impulse response and then apply our inverse filter to it. Okay, here it comes. One, two, three, four. It sounds exactly like the original sound, uh, and this is absolutely no surprise since the equalized room impulse response, we can see that it's a delta function. And what if the sound was convolved with a realistic impulse response, but then uh, we applied a filter that was designed for a different uh, RIR, that was designed for the approximate one? Then it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. It is slightly different, but perceptually, I mean, it is extremely close to the original sound. And here is where we see the power of approximation. So even if we heavily approximate it, um, the real room impulse response, uh, perceptually the result is not too bad. What happens if we have a different kind of model mismatch? Assume that we designed everything almost perfectly, but somehow when we were designing our inverse uh, filter, we thought that the room has a different size than what it has in reality. And we made just 1% error in the room size, then the things would sound like this. Okay, first 
I will play the original sound just so that you remember how it sounded. One, two, three, four. Okay, and now we equalize it with a filter that was correctly designed but for a slightly different room with 1% size error. One, two, three, four. It's just sad. And you can see what happened if you look at the equalized impulse response. It looks nothing like the delta sequence. Also, the frequency domain plot shows that some frequencies are very amplified around here, and some frequencies are very attenuated, uh, very close to these amplified frequencies. Um, it's nothing like the constant that it should be, right around one. So it's clear that some, something bad happened. And it's also something to think about. It tells us that our design method is not really robust. It's quite brittle, actually. And now we'll quickly take a look at a different application where we have two people talking over a phone, over internet, say, or Skype, as is shown in this figure. And a person in room one listens to the sound over headphones and in room two over a loudspeaker. Okay. And what happens now? So when person in room one speaks into the microphone, the sound gets transmitted over, with some delay uh, to the person in room two. And it gets reproduced over the loudspeaker. Notice also that what gets transmitted from room one to room two is not only the voice directly into the microphone, but when person in room one speaks, uh, its voice gets bounced off the walls, so it gets reflected, it gets convolved with room one, and this is what gets transmitted with some delay to room two. Now in room two, it's reproduced over the loudspeaker, and then this sound is again convolved with room two, uh, picked up by the microphone and transmitted back into room one with some delay. Okay. So what person in room one hears in its headphones is its own voice, I mean, coming from, from its mouth. Uh, then it hears person in room two talking, but it also hears the delayed version uh, colored with room one and room two of its own voice, which is extremely annoying. And this is how it sounds like. One, one, three, four, four. Here, for simplicity, uh, we use the room impulse responses that we have explained and computed earlier. So, how do we get rid of this annoying echo? Well, somehow the most natural idea that first comes to mind is we know what gets transmitted from room 1 to room 2. We know what comes in to be reproduced over the loudspeaker. So, call this S of N. So, why not just subtract S of N from whatever is being sent back to room 1? And this is a very nice idea. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, except that it does not sound very well. So here's how it sounds like. One, one, three, four. It doesn't help much. So the reason why it doesn't help much is that not only S of N gets transmitted back to room one, but also the reflections of S of N of all the walls in room two. Okay, so S of N gets convolved with room two and this is what gets transmitted back. So in order to correctly do the echo cancellation, we must first estimate the impulse response of room two. Uh, and this is the role of G of N here. Uh, okay. So we must first estimate uh, the impulse response of room two and convolve S of N with this impulse response and then subtract this convolved signal from whatever is being sent back to room one. Situation is actually a bit more complicated since we also need to estimate the impulse response, for example, of the loudspeaker, which is not just uh, a simple delta, okay? And it's even further complicated by the fact that room two, the conditions in room two change. So people move around, the temperature changes and so on. So, so we must re-estimate uh, G of N over time. So if we take all these things into account, then 
after properly doing the echo constellation, this is the sound that we get. One, two, three, four. As expected, the result is uh, near perfect, right? Because we assumed perfect knowledge uh, of, of, of room two. And so the only deformation that we have in the sound now is uh, coming from, from the fact that it is convolved with room one. We are essentially done here with module 512. And before concluding, I'd just like to ask you the following simple question. Is it really this simple? So I challenge you to work out the formulas for a very simple case. Again, two parallel walls, but where you're not standing exactly halfway between the walls. You're moved to either side. Or there is a significant distance between you and the microphone. So have fun with that. And this is the end of module 5.12.